22 through 27. And the scripture read, reads, But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If anything, they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. It's not often we read from the letter of James, uh, and we ask ourselves, we can begin by asking, who was James anyway? And unfortunately, like many of these questions, the folks who write the commentaries aren't entirely sure. There are two really good possibilities. One is the disciple James, who we may remember as the brother of John. James and John, the sons of thunder, part of Jesus' inner circle. But it is likely that James was already dead by this time, having been killed for his faith. And so the other possibility, the more likely possibility according to scholars, is it was James, the brother of Jesus. But James was in charge of the early church in Jerusalem, the leader of the church for quite a while. And so he knew a lot about the church. And he knew about people. And he had seen folks at their best and at their worst. And so it does seem that James was in a position to write this letter. A letter that focuses on all some of the pitfalls we can face in our faith. Some of the things that he has seen as he's been in the church. He's seen in himself. And he's seen in others. The book of James is can be a little confusing. It's actually most of, the, most of the letters in the New Testament are named after the recipients. Uh, the church in Corinth, the letters are named 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The church in Rome, that letter is named Romans. This letter is named James because James sent this letter, it seems, to a number of churches. No one recipient, and so this particular letter, as a few others are, is named after the sender and not after the recipient. When you look at today's reading, one thing certainly jumps out at me as I look at this, having, having looked at and read through the New Testament, is the use of the word religion. Religion, it's not a word we typically hear in the Bible. It's not found nowhere in the Gospels. Jesus never mentioned it. But here it is, the word religion and being brought up in a way that makes it sound like sometimes our religion can betray us. Or to put it another way, Acting religious, according to James, isn't enough. There's more to being a person of faith than simply acting religious. We see it here in his letter, and it's an important point that he makes. There are times when we can be religious, we can think of ourselves as religious, and yet we can still make a mess of things. Well, how is this possible? And is it true? Well, we do, we'll see it quite a bit, even though Jesus doesn't mention religion, the word, in any of his teachings, he does seem to look at what other people call religion, and he often calls that sin. So people being religious can actually get way off on the wrong track, and we see this most clearly in Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were experts in religion. They were experts at answering all the little questions of religion and doing everything uh, just right. And they become for us, and through the words of Jesus, an example of how religion can go bad. So where, how do we see this? These moments when religion can go bad, when acting religious simply isn't enough. One time we see it, certainly, and again, the Pharisees are an example, is that when in religion, the focus becomes more on the form than on the action. 
more on the form than on the action. Well, this is true throughout history. And in the course of every religious movement, no matter how enlightened, enlightened, no matter how down to earth, that the form of the religion can take on such importance that people will forget about the contents of the religion. So more worried about the vessel than about what is contained within. And this is, uh, we've seen this throughout the ages. Again, we all become, can become susceptible to this when the building becomes more important than the congregation, when the worship comes more important than the community, when the group more come, becomes more important than being welcoming. Again, the Pharisees that Jesus encountered were specialists at religion. They knew just how to do everything just right. And because of that, this fact, the fact that they felt they were doing everything they needed to do, that they were able to check religion off their list and say, okay, I've done that, I've accomplished that. Because of that, they got into trouble. They knew exactly how to prepare their meals. They knew exactly how to wash themselves before they ate. They knew exactly how to pray. They knew, exact, knew exactly what they could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. All of these things that they had checked off. And there they were, thinking that they had it all figured out. The vase, the container, and they seemed to have, in so many instances, especially as they were encountering Jesus, forgotten about the contents. For though they were known as very religious, couldn't help but see it. They, they, they expressed it all the time. They would pray out in public. They would make a show of their religion and who they were, and that they were a part of the right group. But when they looked at other people, they tended not to look at them with compassion. Instead, they seemed to only see their flaws. It is easy to take such pride in our place of membership, of being in the right place, in the right group, having done the right things that we know we're supposed to do, that we forget about the contents, about treating others with Compassion. So concerned about the container, we forget about the importance of the contents. The Apostle Paul put it this way. Hold the form of religion, but deny the power of it. See, that's what he's saying to the Pharisees. They hold the form of religion, but they don't see the power that is there. No wonder that Jesus, when he was talking about the Pharisees, his most common term that he would use to describe them was they're actors. They're actors. Now, our translations of the Bible tend to translate this little phrase that he uses as they were hypocrites. But what it actually technically means, literally means, as are those who were playing a part. Playing the part of religion. It wasn't true with who they were. It wasn't true inside them. But it was the part that they were playing and how easy this is to fall into. To think that we can come and do the things that we need to do to pray in the right way, to worship in the right way, and even to give in the right way and to be able to check that off our list, having acted the part of a Christian. Having done those things that a Christian would do and then turning around and going out into the world and treating each other without compassion, treating those around us without compassion, or, or being, uh, being ugly to our spouse, or being hate-filled toward a group of other people who are different from us. All of these ways, uh, the container can become more important than the contents. The forms of religion, we focus on that, and we do not focus on its power to change us, and to help us to be more Christ-like each and every day. The answer for us then in this respect is we must be willing to evaluate ourselves every day. What part of my faith is simply form? What part of my faith is the outer part of faith? And what part of my faith and my actions represents the substance of faith? How much am I acting and how much am I actually being a person of faith, a follower of Christ, a child of God? I heard the story about a man who applied for a job with a large company. And they said, well, uh, actually, we 
kind of uh, at a point where we have fewer customers. We don't have as much to do around here, uh, so we don't really need someone else. Uh, there's just not that much to do. And he said, oh, that's okay. I wouldn't plan to work very hard anyway. <laughs> but when anyone concentrates on the form of religion, that's what can happen. So little can get done. And in that way, then acting religious certainly isn't enough. It's not adequate. We've marched part of the way down the road, but we haven't taken the final steps to then acting the way that we are supposed to act. Well, here is another way that we see it. this can manifest itself in a negative way uh, in, in, in our world. So when we think that we are a part of the right uh, we have it all figured out, that we have the form figured out, that we can find those who agree with us on the form of religion, and we can come together with them and then divide ourselves from everyone else. And say, we have got this figured out. We are going to divide ourselves from other people. And so we do. And this is actually a big part of Christian history, is us dividing from each other, really based more on the on the outside, on the container of religion than it is of what's on the inside, you know, the actions of faith, which really most Christians pretty much agree about. It's kind of like James said today, what do you do? You take care of those in need, and you try not to let the world spoil you. And that's really what all Christians are trying to do, and yet we have divided ourselves up uh, into different uh, denominations, a whole different, really almost Faiths when it comes to some of these uh, broader uh, ways that we define ourselves. One great example of this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. I've never been there, but I've heard that uh, one of the interesting and discouraging things about visiting the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is one of the most important places uh, in Christianity, is that it is actually divided up among six different churches. Six different churches, each in charge of a different section. There's the Greek Orthodox section, the Armenian section, the Coptic section, the Syrian Orthodox section, the Ethiopian section, and the Roman Catholic section. And what a lot of uh, people have experienced when they've gone to the church, uh, some tourists have been uh, kind of amazed to see these differences and have been amazed at apparently the frequent times that shove-in matches will break out between the different people administering the different parts of the church. Now you may wonder, well, who gets the key to the church with all these different groups? Well, none of them will trust the others with the key to the church. So what do you do? <laughs> You hire a Muslim to hold the key to the Christian church because the Christians can't trust each other to do it. You see, we divide ourselves up. What a sad situation that can be. Division within the church is one of the ugliest things. It can happen, though, when we start saying, okay, well, here's our two different groups. I've got it figured out, but they don't. They're off on the wrong track. And so here's the in group, and here's the out group. And, and it's an old, old problem. In fact, once again, the Apostle Paul talked to it about the church in Corinth. He said, I'm worried about you. I heard you're splitting up into different sections and different groups, and I think this must be true. I think that when you come together, you're breaking up uh, for worship. You're breaking up into different cliques. Anytime a religion does this to us, it betrays us. See, any time this happens, what's happening is we're taking on, uh, we're not we're taking on the form, but we're not taking on the substance of our faith. That's one thing we, one reason I love our church. I love this place. We agree on these core things, these inner things, and then the shell, the container for each of us can then be different. And what does that mean? It means we focus or try to on those things that we agree upon. They are so important. And we can spend our time and our energy on those inner things. And then here, here's another way, uh, another uh, uh, example of this, and it's, uh, it's something that does make me think of our church uh, in the, the teller of this story, the person who, and actually it's a poem, the person who wrote this poem, the person who's speaking in this poem, reminds me of this church and our church, and the very best that it can be. Uh, it's a short little poem that says, He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, 
a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win, for we drew a circle that drew him in. Isn't that lovely? The idea of being able to draw these wide circles just as Jesus Christ did during his life, during his ministry. Big circles. When we draw our circles small, then we know, then we can suspect that perhaps we are acting religious. And that just isn't enough. But here perhaps is the most dangerous part of all this. Acting religious, having the form of religion but not the content, doing things right but not having the compassion, not showing the compassion in our world. And it is this. We become, like the Pharisees, I didn't mean to point to the choir when I said Pharisees. <laughs> like the Pharisees, that direction, we, like, well, I now have lost it. Okay, no, no. We can become overconfident in our righteousness. Right? Because we figured it out. We figured out the form. We're checking all the things off the list as far as religion. We've divided ourselves up, and now we're in the right group. And so, nothing now can get to us. We're all set. And we can become overconfident in our righteousness, and we can fall asleep to our own risk, you know, of temptation, of sin, to be overconfident. Again, the Pharisees are great examples of this. I you just can't help but see it when we look through the Bible. One time, a Pharisee was praying in the temple, and he said, Lord, I am grateful that I am not like other people. You see, that's, that's exactly the flaw. That I am not like other people. I have checked off the boxes. I am doing everything right. I am not like those around me. That circle I've drawn around myself and those who agree with me, those people on the outside of those circles, I'm glad I'm not like them. And of course, Jesus came to remind us that we are all like them. We are all broken. It's the point of our faith. We all need Jesus Christ. Our own righteousness, our own success, our own hard work, all of these things that we take pride in, they're all wonderful, but they don't get us there. Only Jesus Christ can get us there. His love, His forgiveness, His grace, only these things can help us. Can make it possible for us to be in a relationship with God and really in true relationship with one another. Again, treating each other with love and with compassion. It's amazing to think that we do tend to fall for this trap as human beings that oh, it's not possible for me. Thank God I'm not like another, the other man, the other person that's out there. Well, if there's one thing we've learned over the last 40 years of our history is that anyone is capable of falling. Anyone is capable of failing. Anyone is capable of giving in to some temptation just at that weakest moment, being brought down completely by whatever their mistake or their crime, or their sin may have been. We certainly know this because our media knows that there's no story we're more likely to click on, there's no show we're more likely to turn to than a show about somebody who was trusted. Someone who had over the years earned a great position of trust and in some way had then betrayed that trust, whether it's a politician, or a preacher, or a teacher, or a parent, or a doctor, people that betray that trust, that fall low, and we watch those shows and we're so interested in them, they show them to us all the time, and yet we forget it is possible for all of us. We are all broken. And of course that's true of the church too. It's one of the things that James writes about. It's one of the things that the Apostle Paul writes about over and over again is that the brokenness of the world doesn't just exist. There were two kinds of students in seminary. There were the ones who had grown up in the church and, and, and knew about the church. 
had seen the church, had lived in the church, had experienced all sorts of things within the church. Within that group, there was even a smaller subgroup, you know, a little bit more, uh, which was the, the children of ministers and preachers. They know a little bit more, too, about what goes on in the church, good and bad. And there's, there's that group, and then there was this other group, and they were a wonderful group to hang around with because they were the group of people who had who had found their faith anew. You know, they, had, they had, hadn't been in the church growing up, and now they were, and they were back in the church, they were so excited about it, and they had spent a little time in the church and then felt the call to ministry, and off they went to seminary, and there they were in seminary, and they were so excited, and yet we would, we would worry a little bit about it. Because they did have this idea that the church was going to be this place that was better than other places. This place where people always treated each other with love and kindness. Of course, that is not true. For we are broken as well. That's one of the ideas. And again, it's one of the ways our religion can betray us. It's when we think we are not susceptible to these things. It happens here as it happens everywhere else. We are just called to try harder. To try harder to get those contents of our faith right. Any time religion makes me think the form is so good, I've got that down, and the group is so pure, and everybody agrees that I am vulnerable to being one who thinks that acting religious is enough. Now we hear it all over and over again in the Bible. We are all broken. We are all in need. The prophet Isaiah said, we are all like sheep who have gone astray. Not one of them still back in the fold. One beautiful illustration of this I heard was that back in the Middle Ages, the glass blowers in Italy were just starting out their, their, their trade in this. It's in its infancy to create these beautiful glass goblets and bowls and bottles. And they would start working on a, a crystal goblet. And they would begin, and as they were going, often something would happen, a little bubble of air would get into the glass, some flaw would occur, some miscoloring would happen. And what they would do is at that point, they would quit trying to make the precious goblet, and they would make a, a bottle of wine out of it instead, or a wine bottle out of it. So they'd take what they had, what they were going to make, and they would make then this other thing that they could sell for a few pennies, and it wouldn't be a loss. And it just took them a few seconds to make a wine bottle. And... Uh, they called these bottles <laughs> fiascos. Fiascos, which of course has come to me today, and a failure is a fiasco, or can be a fiasco. And of course the point is here is, according to our faith, according to the good news, we are all fiascos. I know that's not good news. For some who think themselves above that, but it's great news for those of the, those who are on the outside saying, oh, I shouldn't come to church. I'm not good enough to come to church. I'm not as good as those good people within the church. But we are all, we are all fiascos. And the good news there is that there is one who can mend every defect. There is one who can bring perfection back into our lives. There's one who we don't have to wait for. We can start Right now, walking with Jesus Christ and not only having that form of faith, but having the wonderful contents of faith as well. All along his way, Jesus was meeting people whose religion seemed to be doing them more harm than good. Because it emphasized form rather than action. Because it divided them. Because it made them fall asleep to their own vulnerability. It made them overconfident. Because we, it's so easy, so easy for us to be these people. For us to do these things. For us to fall into these traps. Then let my prayer is that God may ground us firm in the one who has enough love, enough grace, enough forgiveness to begin us on that journey of being men. So that we are no longer fiascos. So 
one who can make that happen for us, the one who has that grace and that love. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let us bow in prayer. Loving God, we do give thanks that you are with us each day, that you can protect us from all the pitfalls that we can face. Dear Lord, thank you for the contents of our faith, the building, the worship service, for the prayers that we pray, for the scriptures that we read, for the Bible studies that we engage in. But loving God, help us to always remember this is the form. Help us to fill that container, Lord, with love and with compassion. It is in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you are looking for a new church home, I would invite you to come forward during the singing of our hymn of invitation and join with this church by confessing your faith in Jesus Christ or by transferring your membership. Let us uh, stand.